Hey, thanks for, for coming out. I think this is our, um, our fifth town hall Q&A that we've done. And um, this is uh, our sixth. Did I get that wrong? All right, thank you for correcting me. That is the, the spirit with which we do these town hall Q&As is um, I often get things wrong. <laughs> and, um, okay, so you know, the, um, the reason why we started doing these is that you know, we've done them at Facebook, uh, the company, internally for, for many years. And it's this really valuable tradition where, on the one hand, I get to hear uh, from people who work at Facebook and now in, are in our broader community about what the issues that, that you guys have are with, with what we're doing. Right? So what, what we can be doing to serve you better and build better products uh, for everyone in the world. And then at the same time, it's, um, it's a good opportunity for me to try to explain some of the things that, that we're doing uh, and, and have a way to do that directly for everyone in our community so that way I don't have to you know, go through uh, you know, journalists or other folks who, who might have their own agenda when they're writing about us. So, um, so that's, that's what we're doing with our town hall Q&A. And um, I'm really excited that you guys are, are here with us. Um, today is actually, it's my birthday. Um, and, I, and I can't think of... Um, Thank you. Alright. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I I don't have a cake. Um, maybe we have a cake for you guys later after this. Uh, but I, I can't think of anything more fun to be doing on my birthday than um, spending time with people in our community, uh, talking to you guys and hearing about uh, what your your questions are. So so let's get to it. So Charles is going to moderate. Exactly. Um, by the way, there are cupcakes out front. So like, if you guys have cake envy, there's, there's enough for everybody. All right, thanks, Mark. So before we kick off and, and raise hands, I'm going to give everyone a little bit of information of how all this works. So we've gotten thousands of questions from around the world on Facebook. I'm going to read some of those. Some people sent in videos. Um, some people have even flown in to ask their questions in person. Uh, in addition to that, I'm going to turn to you guys here in the room. Um, we're going to take your questions as well, and I'll give you a signal when we're ready for that. But where I want to start is with the most popular question um, from Mark's post. So um, let's dive right in with that. Um, so Mark, this question um, comes from Israel, but is about Ukraine. <laughs> Not to get confusing. Um, so it actually had 45,000 likes um, on, your, on your profile. Um, so it's from Gregory. And he says, Mark, I see many reports of unfair Facebook account blocking, probably as a result of massive fake abuse reports. These often involve the Facebook accounts of many top pro-Ukrainian bloggers and posts about the current Russian-Ukrainian conflict. My question is, can you or your team please do something to resolve this problem? Maybe create a separate administration for the Ukrainian segment, block re abuse reports from Russia, or just monitor the top Ukrainian bloggers more carefully. Help us, please. And as a follow-up to this, and we'll show this on the screen, um, the Ukrainian president, Petro Poroshenko, actually <laughs> sent in a question as well. Um, and he asks, Mark, Will you establish a Facebook office in Ukraine? All right. It's a mouthful. All right, well, let's get into it. Um, so 45,000 votes for that question is a, I think, makes it by far the most voted on question that we've ever had at, at one of these uh, Q&As. So, so I did some research before this to make sure that I had the right answer to this, to this one. Um, you know, there were a few different parts of the question. One was about... Uh, content moderation and um, some specific types of content that have been taken down that uh, some Ukrainian folks have posted. Um, the, the second part of it um, is about how we do moderation and, um, and, and overall kind of what, what our approach is to that. And then the, the third, which uh, Ukrainian president has, has written in on, is uh, will we open up an office in, in Ukraine? So I'll go through each of those. Uh, the, for the first, you know, there's... There's been a bunch of content that, uh, that has been posted that uh, violates the rules that we have around uh, hate speech, right? So we don't 
allow people to post content on Facebook that is overtly hateful towards another group that has ethnic slurs, um, that tries to incite violence towards an ethnic group or anything like that. And, um, and unfortunately, there were a few posts uh, that, that folks were posting that, um, that, that kind of tripped that rule. And, and people, other folks in our community reported that in, and we, we looked at those, and, uh, and we made the determination that, uh, that some of these, these posts included these ethnic slurs against uh, some Russian folks, and, um, and we, we took down those posts. And um, I, I looked into this personally uh, because this question had 45,000 votes on it. So I wanted to make sure that I, that I understood what I was talking about before we got up here. And, um, and I stand by that. I think we, we did the, the right thing according to, to our policies uh, in taking down those posts. And you know, I, I agree with the policies that we have around not supporting hate speech. I think that that uh, is, is a good set of rules that we have on the system. Now, there, there were a couple of questions that, that folks were asking about were these uh, posts by Ukrainians uh, moderated by Russians, where the, there's the ongoing conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine. And there was this meme that was, that was floating around that this policy and, and the content moderation was done out of uh, a Russian office by uh, Russians who were anti-Ukrainian. And, um, and that's not true. So first of all, we don't actually have a Russian office. Uh, so anyone who thinks that this was done out of a Russian office, that should probably put that to, to rest. Um, we also don't have a Ukrainian office, and we actually don't have uh, offices in a lot of countries around the world, but uh, maybe over time. And, um, and what we try to do is when, when people write in uh, and, and, have, and report content, uh, we try to have folks who uh, speak that language uh, review it. And we have a, a European headquarters in, in Dublin. Uh, where we have folks who speak a lot of different languages from around the world, look at the different content, and uh, that's what we did here. Now, we did make one mistake, which was when we reached out to some of the folks to tell them about the content that we'd taken down, uh, there was a bug in our system where we accidentally told folks that we were taking it down because the post contained nudity instead of hate speech. So um, that was a mistake, and we are... Uh, <laughs> that, was a, that was a bug in, in, in the software that we were running. Um, we fixed that. We uh, have reached out and apologized to folks. Um, it's pretty clear if you look at the post that they don't contain nudity, so I understand why that was the, the source of some confusion. Uh, but uh, we'll try not to make that mistake anymore. Uh, to, to the question uh, from the Ukrainian president, and I think a bunch of other people wrote in with this as well, about are, are we willing to, to put an office in Ukraine, um, you know, over time it's something that we might consider. Right? There, there are a lot of advantages to having People who work at the company, um, especially you know, engineers and people who are building products, uh, not spread all around the world, but instead uh, just in a smaller number of offices where uh, people can work more easily together. Right? If you always have to video conference or make phone calls to collaborate with people and you have to work across a lot of different time zones, uh, that puts a big tax on working together and, and makes it very hard. So there are areas like in sales or partnerships where it does make a lot of sense to have local teams uh, who, are, who are working with local partners uh, for things like engineering offices, and which is you know, most of what we do at, at the company. Uh, you know, it really makes sense to kind of try to centralize that in as few centers as possible, which is why we don't have offices in a lot of places around the world. But as we do look to expand over time, we will certainly uh, consider all of these countries. So thank you for, uh, the, for the question that, that 45,000 people voted on and uh, for the Ukrainian president for writing in. I don't think we've uh, gotten that one before. <laughs> Excellent. So I want to go to one of our fly-ins today. Ray, let's start with you. You'll be the first. Yeah. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, my name is Ray. I'm from New York, Brooklyn. And my question was about uh, Oculus devices. And uh, I really wanted to know, like, um, was the Oculus de devices uh, used for uh, in the future by Facebook? And what, what we can expect from a Facebook using the Oculus devices? Is there some kind of a, um, a particular you know, way that we could use in the future Oculus devices? Yeah, so Oculus and uh, virtual reality in general are areas that, that I'm really excited about, right? Because you know, every 10 or 15 years, a completely new computing platform comes along, right? So in the 90s, uh, we had these desktop computers and laptops, and you controlled them through uh, a mouse, and um, it was very indirect. And now we have 
uh, these much more intuitive devices, phones, tablets, where you can tap on them and interact directly with apps and, and software. And you know, when, when the computing devices made that leap from uh, desktop to the, the modern generation, all the apps needed to be rewritten. Right, because the way that you interacted with them uh, is completely different in a world where you're kind of touching your, your device and, and interacting with it directly as opposed to, to indirectly. And um, I think that virtual reality and augmented reality um, are basically going to be the, the next kind of leap beyond this, where you're, we're probably going to need to, you know, people are going to need to rewrite all these different kinds of apps because instead of, um, of using something on, on a screen, um, you're going to be able to be immersed in a 3D world, right? So with, with VR, now you can, you can already buy um, an Oculus dev kit. We're gonna, we announced that the, the first consumer version is going to be coming out in, uh, I think, the first quarter of, of next year. And, but you can already buy a dev kit if you want, where you can, you can put on a pair of, of the goggles or headset. And um, it, it feels like you're just completely immersed in this, in this new world, right? And it can, you can program it to be anything. Um, you know, so people build games. Um, you can be in the middle of uh, a 3D video. Um, so in the future, you'll be able to, you know, be courtside at a basketball game, um, or you know, any, anything like that that you want to be. It, it, it really feels like you're there, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, what I think is going to be really cool is as the the form factor keeps on getting uh, smaller and smaller, and it stops being big uh, goggles or a headset, but instead it just starts looking like normal glasses, right, or sunglasses, where um, you know you can use it without being uh, tied to a, a computer or plugged into a computer in, on your, in your living room. You can move around with it and, and use it anywhere. Um, I, I also think augmented reality, um, so virtual reality is where your whole vision is, is kind of taken up by some computer-generated scene. Um, augmented reality is where you kind of see the world, uh, but you can also put new objects in it, right? So, you know, today if I want to show my friends a photo, maybe I'll pull out my phone and and um, show them the, the, the photo on my phone. In the future, you'll just be able to kind of snap your fingers and instantiate a photo album and, um, or a big photo, make it whatever size you want, and people will be able to see it through their glasses. And I think that's pretty amazing. And it's going to take you know, 5, 7, 10, I don't know, maybe 12 years to build that out and have that be um, something that really works um, and that is cheap enough for, for everyone around the world to use. And these big shifts in computing only happen, you know, once every 10 or 15 years. And, but that's what we're trying to do with Oculus is, um, you know, we, we bought this company that was, is clearly the leader in virtual reality technology, um, realized that there's going to have to be a ton of work ahead. Um, they wanted to join us because, you know, Facebook is a company that can really afford to invest in this and, and believes in, in what we're going to need to do in order to, to achieve that full vision. And um, I just hope that over you know five, seven, ten years um, we we get there and we can deliver this. But you know, starting in 2016, um, you're going to be able to buy a consumer Oculus device and um, and play a lot of games and, and access a lot of uh, immersive video content, and it's going to be really cool. So I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Mark, I want to get to one of our video questions. Don't worry, guys. We'll we'll get a question from the room <laughs> really soon. Um, this one comes from Alicia in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So let's check, turn to the monitors, and uh, tee that up. My question uh, for Mark is, why does Facebook uh, only really advertise uh, for donations on an international and global scale? Uh, I, I have the question here, so I'll read it for you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so she says, why does Facebook only advertise for global disasters and not American ones? Yeah. Um, so as you guys know, there, there was just this really bad pair of earthquakes in Nepal, right, both over, over 7.0. And, um, you know, one of the, the things that we do when there are these natural disasters around the world is, um, is we, we have a series of tools. One is safety check, which uh, we can basically turn on for people who are in an area around a natural disaster, and people can mark themselves as safe, right? Or if... Uh, if you talk to a friend who is in that area, then you can mark them as safe. And what will then happen is all of their friends and family will get notified that they're safe. And, and I mean, it's, you know, for any of you guys who have ever had a, a family member or a friend who is in a region where there's an earthquake or a typhoon or something like that, all you want to know is that they're safe, right? I mean, if, if you, you know, when you love someone, you just want to make sure that they're, that they're okay. So 
you know, out of the, the earthquakes in, in Nepal, being able to get notifications um, that, that people were safe, I think, was a big deal. And, and 7 million people uh, were marked as safe within, I think, a, a day. And, um, and 150 million of their friends and family uh, were notified. So th that's kind of one thing that we were doing. Another is in the event of these natural disasters, we try to you know, help our community come together to uh, raise money for the, release for the relief efforts. And, um, and in this case, uh, the Facebook community came together and donated, I think it was, it was almost $16 million um, in total. Uh, the last number that I saw was, uh, was 15.7 million. Um, and then on top of that, Facebook donated an additional 2 million to the relief efforts. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like that's kind of the least that we can do, right? I mean, there, the, the relief effort is going to be a really long, ongoing thing um, that's going to take hundreds of millions of dollars to rebuild the cities and homes and, and all the stuff that were destroyed. And, and obviously, it can't bring back the thousands or 10,000 people who uh, were hurt or killed in this. But, but it's, um, it's something that I feel like our community can do, and I'm glad that we do that. Um, you know, for... In the U.S., you know, we've been fortunate in that we haven't had a, a crazy earthquake or uh, natural disaster like this recently. Uh, there, there are certainly other issues that we have that we've, that we've tried to build tools uh, to empower people on. So, for example, one example is uh, Amber Alerts. I, I don't know if you guys have, have heard of this, but, you know, there's this program for abducted and missing children, which it's not, um, I mean, that's not, you know, an earthquake. It doesn't affect everyone at once. But when... This program that runs these Amber Alerts hears of a child who has gone missing. Um, they can issue an Amber Alert out to uh, people who are, who are nearby in an area. And, um, and there are a number of places in which these Amber Alerts show up. But you know, we, we realized you know, if we show these on Facebook to people who are in that area, that'll be how most people see them. So we built an Amber Alerts tool. Uh, and you know, we've, we've only actually had to turn it on a few times. But... Uh, you know, fortunately, one of the times that we turned it on, we actually were, were able to help um, someone in our community, uh, looked at it, saw the picture, and then actually s realized that the kid who was missing was nearby, um, understood that because of seeing the Amber Alert on Facebook, and then, and then called the police, and, and um, the kid was, was saved. So, um, so, you know, there are different things, I think, for each of these different communities around the world uh, that we can be doing to, to enable uh, the, the broader Facebook community to come together and, and help people who are in need. And um, we're going to try to do more of those. I just think that this is our social responsibility is to, to give our community more tools to do these different kinds of things. And we'll certainly want to do more over time. All right. So let's open to the room. Who has questions here? <laughs> you have a question? Come on over. Come hang out with me over here. Thank you. Um, so I, my, my name is Sachi. I was actually born in Nepal, and I have a lot of family members there currently. And just having that safety check that you just mentioned was like a great relief. It uh, was hard. The phone lines were hard to reach, and uh, just ha having that safety check was a great factor. And I just want to thank you on behalf of me and like the whole Nepalese community for doing such a great job and, and the donation and everything. It's just been great. So really thank you for all that. All right, let's go for a question now. <laughs> okay, on a diff completely different note, I work in a biotech company, and a lot of these uh, Google, Apple, they're all moving towards kind of biotech, same page as like helping the community with health care and all that. So I was just wondering if in the long future you have any plans of kind of venturing that avenue, like biotech or anything like that? You know, maybe. Uh, but the way that I think we can help solve problems in the world is by bringing people together, right? I mean, that, that's our mission is around uh, connecting people and connecting the world overall. And there are some pretty amazing stories that we hear from folks in our community about how they are coming together um, for health uh, reasons, right? So whether it's um, folks who, who all have uh, an illness in common, um, forming support groups. Um, I've heard stories of folks who all had a, a kind of cancer that there was no treatment for. And um, one, one challenge for, for companies that are trying to design drugs to, to cure diseases is um, you need to find a group of people who has the disease who's willing to be in a trial to run the test. And, and often it, it costs so much money and it's so hard to find people um, who are willing to do a trial for a drug that often drug companies will sometimes prioritize which drugs they develop based on what they think that they will be able to trial. So we've actually heard of examples um, from people 
coming together to create Facebook groups uh, for diseases that did not have cures and were, came together and basically said, you know, all put their hands up and say, if, if a, a company designs a drug, um, everyone who's a part of this group is signed up to be a part of the trial. And then, you know, some companies have actually come through and delivered different trial drugs for that. So, you know, Facebook as a company, we're never going to be the company that's designing the drugs. Right? I mean, that's just not what we're good at in the world. Um, and I, I think that, that would, that's probably not a, a good use of you know, the people at our company because we're just not experts at that. So what we should try to do is empower other folks who are to do their best work. Um, another example that, that I think is pretty interesting on this is you know, we have this whole developer platform where uh, we try to empower um, engineers and, and entrepreneurs around the world to, to build different companies and nonprofits and tools um, that help people connect in different ways as well. And um, there are a couple of tools that have been built, um, especially in other countries, that uh, try to bring people together around like blood donations and things like that. And these are all problems of connecting people, right? And if we can help match people who, who have um, compatible blood types, who need transfusions, um, or you know, match people who um, need to get an organ donation or, or something like that, then um, those are big health problems that we can help solve just by fulfilling this mission of connecting people. And those are the types of things that we're going to look at trying to do more and more over time. Let's go for another video here um, and queue it up um, that comes in from India. Hi, Mark and the Facebook team out there. I am Shambhavi Chaudhary from Bengaluru, India. I am a software developer. First and foremost, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the entire Facebook team for connecting our world like never before. So Mark, my question to you would be, how important is internet.org for the Facebook? And how do you see this initiative making our world a better connected global village? Thank you. Yeah, I and mean, that's, a, that's a good question. So. Uh, for those of you guys who, who haven't heard of internet.org and what we're doing here, um, we have this whole effort where we're trying to help everyone in the world get on the internet. It, it turns out that uh, the vast majority of people in the world have no access to internet, right? And, and living you know, here in, in the US or especially here in, in Silicon Valley, it's pretty easy to, to miss that fact. But it turns out that um, you know, there are about 7 billion people in the world. and. Uh, only about 2.7 or 2.9 billion people have any access to the internet at all. So there are more than 4 billion people, uh, the majority of people in the world, who don't have any access. And that's what we're trying to solve uh, through this internet.org program, where we basically go around the world uh, working with uh, mobile operators and, and governments and local entrepreneurs to be able to offer um, some basic internet services for free. And th the way that I kind of think about this is, it's kind of like, um, you know, in the U.S. we have 911, right? So even if you you can't afford to pay for, you know, your mobile phone, um, you can still always dial 911, right? And, and you can get help on on basic things that you need. And um, and and I just think that there should be a version of this for the internet, where people can access, you know, some basic education information, health information, um, job listings, so, some basic things that you need. And um, the the idea is that by getting access to this this content. Um, we actually find that more people who use these basic services then go and decide to go pay for a data plan and get full access to the internet. So you know, out of those 4 billion people, it actually, a, a lot of them can afford to pay for the internet, but you know, maybe they grew up and they didn't have a computer, and they haven't used the internet, and they're not sure why they, they would want the internet yet, but by trying it out and, and using some of these basic services, a lot of folks um, then end up using it. So what we found uh, in research that, uh, that, that other firms and, and companies have done is that for every 10 people that gain access to the internet, uh, one person is lifted out of poverty. So in countries like India, right, I mean, India has 1.25 billion people, and uh, actually more than a billion of them are not on the internet. So if, if we could snap our fingers and connect uh, all of them, then there would actually be 100 million uh, fewer people in India in poverty. So I, mean, I actually think that this is one of the bigger things that we need to go around and, and do in the world. And it kind of makes sense, right, if you think about it. If, you know, I mean, people need a lot of things to, to live good lives, but access to education information, um, health information, um, job opportunities, all that, that kind of stuff, 
um, are a lot of the things that people need to be able to go get jobs and, and, and join um, the modern economy. So in, in a country like India, where a lot of people are not connected to the internet, um, giving people those tools really is pretty empowering. And it's not the only thing that needs to happen, but I think it's one of the, the big things that we're, that we're working on doing. So um, that's a big effort for, for Facebook. Um, we're, uh, it's one of the things that I'm really passionate about. Uh, you know, our mission is to help connect everyone in the world. Obviously, we cannot do that if the majority of people are not even on the internet. When we were getting started as a small company, you know, when, you're, when I was getting started in my dorm room, you, you don't kind of dream about one day we're not just going to build a service that a lot of people use, but we're also going to try to get people on the internet. But you know, now we, we're a bigger company, and, and a lot of people use Facebook, and we have the resources to go try to take on some of these bigger problems. Uh, so I feel like we have a responsibility to do that. And we're, so that's just, I actually am spending a lot of my time doing this, um, flying around, meeting with different governments, and, and trying to get uh, folks on board to support this program, and, um, and we're making good progress. This week, we launched in our 10th country, Malawi, and um, as of this week, uh, there are now a billion people who are in countries that uh, internet.org supports uh, who can you know, go into a store, get a, get a phone, and, and get some free basic internet access. And um, you know, it's not a billion people using it yet. We still have a lot of work to do in terms of um, getting the word out that this is available. But there are, um, I think the, the latest number was 9 million people who are using the internet for the first time who, who were never using it before because of uh, the efforts that, that um, internet.org is doing. So I'm, I'm excited about this and, and um, excited to keep doing it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we launched in Bangladesh earlier this week, too. So yeah. I want to cut um, to someone who has actually flown in to ask a question mark. So, um, Josh, um, it's your moment. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, Josh Dooley, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, my question was, has Facebook considered something like a newsreel uh, to broadcast current events that are more lined up with, like, Facebook strategy, goals, and values? So not just current events that I can get from any media outlet, but um, all of your acquisitions or just what initiatives Facebook is involved in, things, a uh, way to share that. Um, so I appreciate the question because the implication is that you're interested in, in, um, in Facebook news, which, um, which I, I don't know if most people who use Facebook do. So, um, so, so I, I appreciate that. And um, you know, probably the best thing for your question is, you know, we have pages, right? I'm just like a lot of businesses around the world. Um, we have a Facebook page. We have pages for uh, different kinds of work that we do. So, I mean, we have a page for Oculus, a page for internet.org, and, and you can subscribe to those pages and, and get updates on all the different things that we're doing uh, from that. Now, our, our principle in designing our product is that we try to not have an editorial voice overall, right? So we don't want to uh, put in people's news feeds content about Facebook unless they've specifically asked for that content, right? I mean, our, our mission is to, is to basically help connect people, um, help people stay in touch with the people they love, their friends, uh, the interests that they care about. But all that stuff is are things that you know, people sign up for, right? I mean, you, you become friends with the people that you want to hear from. Um, you like the pages that you want to get content from. So you know, the, I think it's something like 60 million people or might actually be 160 million. I forget the exact number. I have liked uh, the Facebook page, and I think are getting content from it. Uh, but for those who, who are not interested in hearing news about Facebook, then we're not going to kind of push that into, into your news feed. Um, this is a good opportunity, though, to talk about some, some new stuff that we actually are doing with news that I'm pretty excited about. This week, we just announced uh, this new product called Instant Articles. And, um, and the, the basic idea of this is that you know, I don't know how many of you guys uh, read news and, and, and click and tap on links that you see in, in Facebook. But from my perspective, it's actually one of the more annoying things and, and that, that, that I really don't like about the Facebook app right now is you're browsing through and you're scrolling and you come across a story that you want to read and you tap on it and it takes 10 seconds to load. And um, so one of the things that we're starting to do is work with news sources directly so that way they can, they can just send the, the news to, to in, into our servers. And that way, when you tap on that article, it just loads immediately. And you know, from my perspective, faster is always better when you're designing products. Um, you know, no one in our community has ever told us, I want to wait longer to get access to content. Um, and a lot of people complain and tell us that one of the best things that we can do is just make stuff faster and faster and faster. And we have a lot of people who are working on that. So 
that's one of the things that I'm most excited about is uh, hopefully, you know, over the next year or so, uh, we'll work with a lot more partners to get more content to load quickly and make the news experience within Facebook better regardless of what kind of content you're interested in. All right, let's go back to the room. Who has questions? Uh, let's do this quadrant now, sir. Stand up. I'll hold this for you. Hi, my name's Kurt. How are you? Happy birthday. I had a question. I'm a Zanga gamer. I play uh, Mafia Wars constantly. I'm addicted. Um, <laughs> and what's happening right now is posting in private groups and so forth is they're being blocked. People are being blocked constantly. And there's a constant thing where they're coming in and then they complain about it and then they get blocked a little bit longer. And my question is, what is Facebook in the future, their way of handling this type of situation and their, you know, the social media gaming for Facebook in the future? How is that going to be handled? Wait, so what are people being blocked for? It's know. considered spamming. And they're in, spamming in to private and closed groups. Well, if you join a closed group, you're accepted into it. There's an administration that can handle it. If you're spamming that, you would be kicked out. But what's happening is they, people are just leaving like Mafia Wars constantly. I've lost seven people in my clan alone, Mafia War gods, <laughs> in three weeks. Yeah. And we only got allowed to 100 people. Pretty soon yeah. we're, we're going to be empty. <laughs> so, all right, so this is, a, this is a good question. All right, so, um, so games are very interesting on Facebook in that the experience for games has been pretty polarizing, right? There's a... A set of people, uh, it's, it's a large set of people, I think it's, you know, 100 million or more, um, who are really into games, right? Who, who um, a big part of their Facebook experience is, is playing games and, and posting about the games that they're playing and sharing stuff from their games to be able to trade items and level up and, and get the stuff that they need. Um, for a whole lot of other people on Facebook, uh, we get very negative feedback because a, a lot of people are, are, tell us, I never want to see anything about games. Everything that I see about games is, um, is spam, and you know I don't I don't care if you're um, if you've gotten to the next level on your farm, right? I mean that's like that's not for me. If people want to do that, then that's cool, uh, but that's not me. So this has been this this interesting balance that we've had to to uh, to figure out for games because most other content types don't have this, right? I mean there are, I don't think anyone in our community has ever said. I don't like photos. Like, if you could just show me everything except the photos, that would be cool. Um, that's not something that we've heard. But with games, it is. Um, so we've tried to build these systems that basically uh, can try to figure out who is into games, who isn't. Um, so that way, we, we show people who are into games more content and, and people who aren't uh, less of that and, and just try to get better at better at, at you know, not showing stuff that people are going to think is spam while still enabling people to do uh, what they want. Um, it's a constant struggle and, and constant improvement. It's not the type of thing where you solve that problem and that you're done. We'll be working on that forever. <laughs> and um, so it's, it's not that big of a surprise that, that uh, what you're saying is that we can do a better job because um, I think everyone on the team here knows that we can do a better job, um, both for the people who are game players and, and love this stuff and, and for the people who don't want it to be a part of their experience. So. Um, yeah, I guess the, the, the basic answer is we just need to get better at, at understanding who is in which, is in which camp and, um, and making sure that we're showing the right content to the right people. So I have a timely question from the thread that I just want to read, um, and it comes from Mireille. Location unknown, but it sounds French to me. Um, she says, Mark, okay, I'm asking, what are you and Priscilla planning to do for your birthday? <laughs> Nothing. Um, I'm a low-key birthday person. I mean, my view is like, I get too much attention the rest of the time. So I would like to just kind of have people leave me alone on my birthday. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go home. We're probably gonna cook dinner, um, hang out with our dog, and, and that's my idea of a, of a wonderful evening. Um, you know, last year I actually. So this year I'm turning 31. Uh, last year I turned 30, and um, I actually arranged it so I wasn't even. Um, I, I flew to the other side of the country for my birthday. I was like, oh, well, maybe if I have some business meetings on my, on my birthday, then, um, then people at Facebook can't bug me or, um, or try to like, do anything or surprise me. Um, I was wrong. I, I came back. Uh, my, my assistant had filled up uh, my conference room with balloons, um, which was pretty funny. But then, you know, I'm a really stubborn person, right? So, so then it was like, oh, that was a funny surprise. Like, maybe, 
um, should we clear the balloons out? I'm like, no, no, I'm going to just do all my meetings with all those balloons. And, 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 and so then it, it gave way to some pretty funny dynamics because, like, you know, the normal reviews that I have, like, a lot of them are, are pretty contentious. Product teams will come in and they'll, um, they'll talk about what they, they want to do or what they think they're doing. And I'll say, well, you know, are you, are you really doing what people want? And, and we'll, like, have this debate back and forth. And there was this particularly contentious review that we had, and I'll just never forget it, because we were sitting there, it was ridiculous. We're all like up to our waist in balloons, <laughs> and like, and like, everyone is just so sad. And, like, and, and they're all just like sitting there, and I'm just like, it's like, you guys have to do better work. It's like, you're letting our community down. We like need to do better work, and, they're, and it's just like, it's, so I think we have this wonderful photo of that, where it's like everyone is just up to their waist in balloons, and like everyone is just like, Oh man, what are we doing? Um, so we're not doing that this year, uh, but I, I think I'm just going to go home and, and cook a meal. <laughs> Excellent. So next, I want to go to Troy, who's flown in here um, for his question. Hey, did Mark? I'm Troy from Mesquite, Texas. Um, kind of a weird question. More towards you than Facebook. Um, what was your favorite video game growing up as a kid, and did that lead into any programming thoughts uh, to get to where you are now? No, I think this is a really good and important question. Uh, my favorite game, since I was a kid, and I still actually really like it, although it's a few generations later, is Civilization. Um, you get to uh, kind of build up. It's, it's, just a, it's a really fun game. I, um, you know, helping a civilization design an economy and develop science and stuff like that and try to keep everyone peaceful. Um, I, I, I like that. Uh, but what, what I really did a lot when I was a kid uh, was I, I made a lot of games for myself. And they were terrible, um, but, uh, but this was how I got into programming. Was, you know, I, I got a computer uh, when I think I was, I was 10 or 11. Um, I started using my, my parents' first computer and then got my own and um, was playing games and wanted to uh, make them better. So I, I just started kind of messing around and, and designing some stuff myself. And the games were, were terrible by any objective uh, measure of a game, but there's some gratification that you get when it's your game, right? And and when you're playing something that you designed, um, and you know, so I would do these things like, you know, I grew up in, in New York, and you know, there was all the snow, and I would kind of force my sisters to have snowball fights, and they didn't want to do that, so instead I made like a snowball fight game. So then everyone was happy, right? I mean, it was a terrible game, but like I got to play a game, they got to not get hit with snowballs. It was just a win all around, and. Um, you know, I do think that this dynamic around um, kids growing up and building games and playing games is an important one because I, I actually think that this is how a lot of kids get into programming. And, you know, I, I hear a lot that um, parents are concerned about uh, their kids playing games, and, and there are valid concerns, and I think that there, there's an important debate to, to be had around that. But I do think that if you're a parent and, um, and you, you don't let your, your children use technology, um, but you also want them to grow up to be a computer programmer or at least be able to, or not want to, but be, be open to that if, if that's what they want to do, um, then, I, then I actually think giving people the, the opportunity to play around with different stuff is actually um, one of the best things you can do to, to kind of help people um, explore their, um, give them a creative outlet and, and, and give them experience with things that they can then kind of mess around with and build some of themselves. I, I definitely would not have gotten in, into programming if I hadn't played games when I was a kid. So Mark, I want to throw a question in here that uh, seems to have been a hot topic uh, recently. Um, and it is, we've been seeing a lot of headlines in Europe about tensions with tech companies like Facebook. What's your take on that? All right, well, that's a big one. Um, so what's my take on this? Um, you know. There are a few different big trends that are going on, I think, in, in Europe and around the world. One, one big one is that this phenomenon of a company, a technology company, but really any company, um, being able to get started and then you know, 10 years later be serving a billion people around the world, um, that's pretty new in the world. Right? I don't think that that's, that's something that was not really possible um, 30 years ago. Uh, and the technology enabling that, it, it, it kind of changes a lot of things and, and opens up a lot of questions. And I think governments around the world are kind of figuring out what the right frameworks are for, um, for regulating really important issues uh, like 
privacy and security and things that are really important, right, and that, that companies take seriously, but that also people rightfully rely on their governments to make sure that, um, that, the, that there are the right laws around these things and that everyone is kind of acting in a good way. So that's kind of one trend is just that uh, this, this phenomenon of new companies um, is, is kind of a big one, a new one. The, the other thing in Europe specifically is um, there's this big debate around how much uh, Europe should be a union, right, like the, the U.S., um, versus a bunch of independent countries. And, um, and I think that that's just a, a long-term ongoing debate. I mean, there's the EU and there's the euro, um, but each country also has a strong national identity. And um, one dynamic that, that we see is that each country has very different laws. And that makes it very difficult uh, to know what you're supposed to do as a company trying to offer services. Right, because you, you're trying to conform to, um, you know, in, in some cases, it's 20 different versions of different kind of laws. So there's this big push in Europe recently to create uh, what, what I guess the, the term that they're using is a single uh, digital market, right, for, for the internet. So basically, to have one broad set of uh, uh, internet regulations um, across the EU, and and I think that that would be very good. Uh, because if you do that, you will make it so that it's easier for, for companies to offer services, um, easier for them to comply with the laws because they actually know what the laws are in all these different places and there aren't 20 or 30 different sets of rules to follow. And, um, and the framework on this is pretty simple. You know, companies um, need to have a European headquarters. Facebook does. Uh, we have our international and European headquarters is in Dublin. Uh, I mentioned that earlier. And um, we have a big center there. It's a, it's a great city. Uh, that has a lot of different talented folks and, and a diverse set of people um, who can come and, and do great work. And um, so we have our, our um, international and European headquarters are in Dublin. And, um, and we basically uh, work with the, the regulators there to comply with the European laws. And I think one of the big questions is, is Europe going to settle on having a, Euro a, a, a single digital market around Europe? Or are they going to try to get to a, a place where each country has a lot of different laws? And I think a single market would just make a lot more sense and would lead to better services for people in Europe and um, just more ability for companies like us to know what we're supposed to do. All right, let's go to the room. Um, all right, let's get this quadrant over here. We haven't been over here. How about you? Uh, hi, Mark. Um, my name is Lan, and I'm a high school student at John F. Kennedy High School in Fremont, California. So my, my two... Uh, biggest role models in tech are Sheryl Sandberg and Marissa Mayer. And my question to you is, um, how do you, how do Me you plan, <laughs> how, how do you plan on addressing the, the gender gap in tech? Yeah, I mean, the, this is, these are really important questions. So, um, so it's, diversity in tech is a really big issue overall. And it's not just women, it's also racial, right? And um, so there, there's a lot of work needs to, to be done. Um, you know, I can tell you what we're doing in the near term and then longer term, right? So in the near term, there's this issue, which is just that there are not a, enough um, folks who are graduating with uh, degrees in, in engineering and computer science and the things that we need to be kind of the proportion that we, would, that we would like, right? I mean, ideally, you know, we'd reach a state where, you know, half of people uh, in the country are, are women, um, and, you know, there's some percentage of people are, are different minorities, and we'd like to have that match um, what we have internally, right? Uh, I mean, it would be great if, if we could have half our engineers be women and, um, and kind of the same proportional um, base uh, uh, for different minorities. I think that that would be valuable um, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because we would build better services, right? I mean, there's a lot of studies that show that diverse teams just perform better, right? I mean, you have um, diversity of ideas, um, you know, people, you, you have more perspectives. I mean, how can we as a company uh, based out here hope to serve uh, more than a billion people around the world if we don't have a good amount of diversity in our company that are building these services and, and interacting with people? So this is a big thing that, that we're really focused on. Um, in the short term, when the supply is too short, right, there are, there are not enough um, female engineers or black engineers um, or Latino engineers to, to get to the goal that we have. Um, so what we do is uh, we just try harder to go find and, and recruit the folks who are out there, right? Um, so, you know, we'll, um, we actually have specific teams uh, that, that do diversity recruiting. And, you know, it might take, 
you know, one recruiter at Facebook uh, might be able to recruit, I'm just going to make a number up, but say 10 people a year. Um, but, you know, because recruiting for diversity is, is harder, um, you know, we'll, we'll say, okay, we'll, we'll have this pool of folks who are just focused on diversity. And even if you just recruit five of these harder to find folks uh, for the year, then that's awesome because we need these people. Um, and so we, the bar is the same, right? So we don't, um, we, we have kind of the same talent bar for, for everyone, but you know, what we know is that we, we just, we want to go out and, and find more candidates, um, a disproportionate amount of candidates who are women and minorities. That way we can um, have folks who, who come into the company and, and grow the percentage of our diversity. Longer term though, we're not going to solve this problem unless we start earlier in people's lives and, and get more folks to go into studying computer science in some of these fields, right? Which I, I think is why some of these questions like the, the question about gaming are, are important, right? Because um, you know, we as a society need to get to a point where um, you know, everyone has the same opportunity and the same um, ability to be playing with technology and, um, and experimenting with different things because you know, that's how you eventually get into, into engineering and, and you, you learn and you, you mess around with things and you design some things and you know, most of the engineers who I know um, who are the best engineers are self-taught, right? I mean, it's not because they took some class, it's because they're just interested and they got into it. Um, so I think we need to work on ways as a society to get, to get more exposure out to people so that way you know, the next set of high schoolers who are coming through uh, the system, um, by the time that you graduate from, from college, um, we don't have the same um, underrepresentation of diversity in, in, the, in the graduate pool. So there's a short-term and a long-term thing. We've got to do both. It's really important. Um, it's not just the right thing for society, but when we do this and when we get to a better state, we will build better services for the world. So next, I have a fashion question, actually, that's come in from this the thread. Is, this it, can't it, be good. It, it, it's it's going to be great. It's going to be great. It's good to think about you know, on your birthday. So it's from, it's from Nia, um, who writes in from Switzerland. She says, Mark, what are you going to do when you get tired of wearing t-shirts and hoodies in the coming years? I mean, it seems a bit odd for an 80-year-old to wear a hoodie. <laughs> All right, well, I have like 50 more years, so, um, so I think I'll figure that out by the time I, I hopefully, I, I live to be 80. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. My, my philosophy on this, which I've, you know, uh, interestingly enough, this is not the first question in a town hall Q&A about, about gray t-shirts, but, uh, you know, the philosophy is, you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about fashion, as you can see, and, um, and, you know, that's because there's, there's a lot of uh, psychological research that shows that when people make decisions, it kind of, it, it takes some of your energy, right? Even if it's a small decision, like what you're going to eat for breakfast or what you're going to wear or, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to spend my, my energy on that. I want to come in and, um, you know, spend my time and my energy um, working on things that are going to build better products and help connect the world, right? So even if this is just a small thing, it, it helps me not have to think about, about some of this other stuff, and, and I appreciate that. So, um, so I don't know. When, when I'm 80, uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, who knows what kind of incredibly unfashionable thing I'll have. Maybe I'll wear like a unitard. I mean, it's, um, <laughs> or a one piece. A unitard may be bad, but I'm a, what is it called? A, a onesie? Yeah, I mean, that would be... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it sounds comfort focused. I, I like that. Yeah. Uh, so we have one more person. I think is what I meant. I think <laughs> yeah. Unitard B would um, traumatize good. a lot of people. Onesie's good. Um, um, so we have one more person who's flown in, Ramsey here. So I want to make sure we get to you. Uh, first of all, happy birthday. Um, I'm from Kansas City. My name is Ramsey Mosin. Uh, my question is about Messenger. You know, earlier this year you announced the platform. A lot of really cool, exciting features that were announced. I'm curious. You know, what's your vision for Messenger? Do you, do you see it as a replacement for email? Um, what, what's your vision for the product? Yeah, so this is, we're really focused on, on messaging right now. And you know, we, we build Messenger, uh, which a, a lot of people are using now uh, to connect with, with uh, friends on Facebook. Uh, we also acquired WhatsApp, um, and they joined us last year. And a lot of people use WhatsApp around the world for, uh, for free text messaging and, and really just a, a fast, reliable service. So, you know, the, the goal is um, we want to build all of the, the basic communication utilities that, that people want to use, right? And we want to make higher quality versions of, of what um, you've had in the past, and we want to make them free, right? So, uh, you know, so in the past, 
you know, people had to pay for SMSs. Um, in a lot of countries, it's still actually quite expensive uh, to pay for SMSs. Um, people are paying for, for phone calls and long-distance phone calls. And, um, you know, we just think that all that stuff, we can make it better and, and we can make it cheaper. And, um, and that's valuable for folks. So, you know, we, with services like Messenger and WhatsApp, uh, they're free. Uh, people use them to communicate a lot. Uh, you can express a lot of different things that you couldn't necessarily do in texting. Um, you know, you can communicate in groups, right? So texting over groups is, is kind of annoying and, and pretty cumbersome. Uh, but with things like Messenger and WhatsApp, um, that's actually, it's super easy to do. It's actually a lot of what people do is they, they have a group for their family or a close group of friends, and, and they'll just have this thread, and it'll be running for, for months or, or, or a really long period of time. And that might be the primary way that they keep in touch with folks. Um, so that, that's really cool, and, and we're trying to enable that. Um, I'm really excited recently about um, VoIP calling, right? The, the ability to uh, call someone through Messenger or WhatsApp now, too. And one of the reasons why I'm excited about this is that the, uh, the, the quality of calls that you can make with VoIP is actually higher than the quality that you can make by making a normal voice call on your phone. Because they actually go over two different networks. Uh, the voice call goes over this uh, voice network that mobile operators have, and VoIP goes over the data network that the, the internet goes over. And the internet is going over a much higher bandwidth connection. So uh, when you're making a VoIP call, you can actually, um, it's a much higher bit rate. It's, it's much more fidelity. And if you, if you go try this out after this Q&A, uh, give someone a call on Messenger or WhatsApp, you'll probably notice that it's, it's just a higher quality call and it's free. So um, I, I think if we can deliver this to you know, not only people here in the US, but all over the world, especially where a lot of people are still charging a lot for this stuff, um, that's really valuable, and, um, and it's a really important utility for, for helping people stay connected. Right? A lot of what people do is just text the people that they love. Okay, I want to go back to the room. My folks over here haven't gotten a question yet. Uh, what about you, sir? Back there, you want to come hang out with me over on the side? Hi, Mark. My name is Prabhanjan. And I wanted to talk about some of the social services that you're talking about adding into Facebook. As you know that now it's more than a billion people on Facebook, and most of them are youngsters. So the religion is going to be religion now, a new religion, according to me. And for some countries like India, developing countries like India, where there are educated people, but they don't have enough guidance, can you make something new in Facebook, like task of the week or video of the week, where you get someone to talk about some uh, co coming issues in the future like uh, deforestation or pollution or such kind of social issues that are going to come very, they're very near to us. So. Uh, and for kids who are growing up, they're spending their time on Facebooking, on chats or messenger, I mean messaging, but there can be other things like, you know, some of the videos that you can make it like, you know, the project of the week where children are, they're interested to build some projects and then you can actually nominate a leader among them and, you know, Make this, uh, make this feature grow like an intellectual property in them? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it, this is a good question. You know, wherever possible, our philosophy is to try to not insert ourselves, but instead just let people share what matters to them. Right, so a lot of these things, you know, we, we build tools like trending topics where, you know, if a lot of people are talking about something, we'll, we'll surface that more. Um, you know, even the, the, the stuff that we highlight, like uh, the earthquake in, in Nepal, you know, we didn't actually do the work, right? I mean, we just highlighted it because, you know, we knew that this was an important thing that a lot of people cared about. And, and we donated money, but our community actually came together and donated a lot more money. Um, and and they, the community did that, right? I mean, we didn't, we didn't do that. Uh, so overall, I think the goal over time is going to be not to do more and more ourselves, but to build more and more tools um, to empower people to organize around all these different causes, right? So whether it's um, you know raising awareness uh, for the kind of causes that you're that you're talking about, deforestation or or whatever different issues people care about, and there's certainly a ton of different important issues in the world that need to. Uh, get dealt with and, and solved, um, or you know, health issues like the ones that we talked about earlier. Um, you know, our goal over time will be to build tools that empower people to do that. 
uh, and, and use the social network and, um, and the connections that they have on Facebook to kind of self-organize in groups of people that are interested in taking on these different problems and have the solutions come about that way rather than having the answer always be, you know, we put something on the top of the, on top of newsfeed, right? Which obviously that's not that scalable and we can't do that every day and can't cover all of the important issues in the world. So I do think that this is gonna be a much better way to solve these issues over time is just giving people more and more tools to, to do this. Mark, we actually got um, a question on the thread about Mother's Day. Um, and I spied your mom in the audience, so I feel like this is going to keep you really honest. Um, there you go. But, no parents. But um, people want to know, what did you do with your mom for Mother's Day this past Sunday? Um, we had, so I'm lucky. My, my whole family uh, lives out here. And, um, and so, I mean, so everyone came over for, for a nice brunch, and, um, and we all thanked my lovely mother who is here um, for, I mean, really, um, I mean, growing up, um, you know, I mean, you guys really did a lot to, to give us opportunities and, to, you know, I mean, you sacrificed a lot and did a lot of hard work. And I mean, I, I really appreciate that I was able to, you know, come home after work, uh, after school every day and, and see you guys and. I don't know. I mean, that's definitely shaped me and in and, and my life a lot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I feel fortunate to, to have my, um, my parents around here and be able to see them frequently and uh, have my parents be able to come by our town hall Q&As, <laughs> um, which I actually didn't even know you guys were going to come, but, um, <laughs> but that's awesome. I'm, I, I, you guys are welcome to come to any of, any of my town hall Q&As. <laughs> Um, and, and even if you weren't welcome, I don't even think I'd be able to say that because you're my parents. So, um, so yeah. So, it, but I, I thought it was nice. We, we had a nice, a nice brunch. All right, I've got one last question here. I think here from Andrew. Okay. Hi, Mark. Um, so I have one question. I'm a small business owner. Uh, I have a place called Boba Guys up here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I uh, have a question. So, given the decline in organic reach. How should businesses like ours or any business think about the uh, role of pages? Yeah, this is, this is an important question. Uh, so just to, to give some context on this, you know, we're always trying to improve uh, the, the algorithm that shows the most relevant content in newsfeed, right? And there have been a few questions that um, have touched on this. I mean, there was the game question before where, you know, some folks want to get game content, some folks don't. Um, you know, some folks want to see a lot of content from businesses in their news feed, others don't. Um, and what we try to do is continually improve um, how accurate we are in just in getting people the content that they're going to be interested in their, in the system. Um, so that, that's what we're trying to do with all, all the changes that we're making in news feed. For, for some of this, uh, for people who are less interested in in getting commercial content or um, content from businesses, um, we're showing less of that content. And that is leading to some businesses getting less um, organic reach, basically, when they post from their pages uh, than they used to. They might have, they might have used to reach um, you know, half of their fans in a day. And now, um, I'm just making up numbers, but because but, this is going to vary by business to business. But now, maybe instead, you're reaching um, you know, half of that. Uh, so the, the question is, you know, why, how should you think about that? And there, there are a couple of things as a business owner that, that I would suggest that you think about when you're running uh, your Facebook page. The first is that regardless of the changes that we've made, Facebook actually is still the best way to distribute stuff to all of the people that, you, that, you, that you're trying to reach and all your customers, right? I mean, it's, um, you know, probably all your customers or most of them are, are on Facebook. Um, and you probably have more connections on Facebook than any other tool. Um, so I actually think that even if, if the amount is declined a little bit as we are trying to make people's news feeds better and more personal, um, Facebook remains a great way to reach people. So that means that from that perspective, you probably don't actually need to adjust your behavior that much. Um, the second thing is that a lot of businesses, I think, focus on uh, the distribution of news feed, right? And how much are their posts being seen in news feed? And that doesn't take into account um, a second really important thing, which is that a lot of people actually go visit pages, right? And especially on mobile, where um, you know a lot of websites just are not 
designed well for, for mobile web yet, right? So they're, they're still designed for big screens and they don't display well on a browser. Um, you know, it was a lot easier to navigate to um, a small business web page on desktop, whereas on mobile, most people uh, spend more of their time in apps than on the web. And, um, and a lot of people probably aren't going to um, download a lot of apps for every small business that they interact with. What we're seeing is that people's pages on Facebook are actually becoming a more and more important presence where customers will actually go look them up to see you know, hours that a restaurant or a store are open, um, to see what their friends think about it. Um, typical types of things that you might have previously gone to the website to go see. So, uh, so I guess that's kind of how I would think about Facebook pages uh, running a, a business. One is that the distribution is still really good, um, even as we're going to continue tweaking it to give everyone the best news feed experience that we can. Uh, and two is um, focus more on the, the part where people are actually directly navigating to your page to create the, the biggest, to create the best landing experience that you can for mobile. Because in the future, I think a lot of people are going to go to uh, business Facebook pages um, in addition to web. So that's all we have time for. Um, all right. That's the end of it. I'll let well, you thank close you for, us out, Thank Mark. you for coming out. Um, you know, these, these town hall Q&As are... Um, Everybody have a seat. Can well, you guys one, stay one, in your seats one, for me? One Thanks. moment. Um, you know, the, these, these Q&As are really valuable for me. Um, it's, I, I, I love doing them and, and hearing what you guys are thinking about, and hopefully I uh, gave some, some useful answers and, and, and information. But it's also really useful for me just to hear what you guys are thinking about. And, um, and I'm definitely going to go take away uh, the questions that you guys are asking and have voted on. And um, I'm going to go meet with our teams and try to make sure that we do a better job to serve you better in, in everything that we're doing. So now to, uh, to wrap up, uh, I think we're going to take one big group picture. But yes. everyone, stay seated. All right. Um, All right, I got don't, this. Don't everyone come rush me. Exactly. Um, okay.